Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege to come before you. We thank you for just keeping us and bringing us into yet another month. Um, and we just pray you will continue to have your way in our lives. But right now, we ask that you would meet us here in this place as we praise and worship you. But not just in this place, but wherever we are participating in this service, whether we're in our living rooms, whether we're in our cars or anywhere else, and whenever we watch, whether we are watching now, live, whether we're watching later on Facebook, on YouTube, or wherever else we may be, we just pray that you would have your way, that you would get the glory out of what we do today, but that you would meet us here because we know we can't do this without you. So we just pray you would have your way, move within us, work within us, and meet us where we are today. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service. Uh, today is the first Sunday in September. So yeah, this month is really going away pretty quickly. Well, not this month, but obviously this year, because it just feels like, well, part of it for me is that, you know, this is my first year as a parent, and it feels like time just progresses a little differently when you have a baby, which you'll be happy to know that first lady and baby boy are upstairs watching and participating. In fact, what you can kind of see on the side, First Lady is the one who prepared my communion today. And that's something for me to remind all of you. Today is a first Sunday, which is a communion Sunday. So make sure you get your symbols of the body and blood of Christ together, because right behind um, the sermon, we're going to bless them. And for those who need a reminder, um, those symbols for the body of Christ, you can use anything that's bread-based, whether you know a piece of bread, a cracker, a pretzel, and for the wine, we prefer for it to be something that is grape based, you know, so whether that's wine or whether that is um, grape juice or anything like that. But really, you know, we still are in the middle of a pandemic and we don't want you to make a special trip out to the store to buy something if you haven't done it already. So whatever um, beverage you have that you would like to use to represent the, the blood of Christ, just make sure you got that ready as well. But yeah, we are happy to be here today. Um, I think that I'm always, well, I've been in a bit more of a contemplative mood lately anyway, but today especially because for those of you who follow us on social media, you know, our personal accounts, you know that a year ago today is when we first announced that we were expecting, I mean, people who are close to us already kind of knew, but we announced to the community at large that we were expecting. And again, I'll say some of you from the church had already figured this out because you know, you kept seeing First Lady rubbing her stomach or if she'd been sick and missing some services. But, you know, we finally had a chance to um, announce it this time last year. And now, you know, I look at the memory come up on Facebook while I'm sitting next to my high energy six month old. So, yeah, that's why I'm saying like time waits for no one. <laughs> You know, it feels like it was just yesterday that we were waiting for him to get here, and now he has taken over our lives. Um, but we are glad to be here. I say we, even though you only see me, because as I say every Sunday, there is a whole team that keeps us together, and we want to um, acknowledge them as well. There are a lot of people who work behind the scenes, and I want to thank them, because without them, we wouldn't still be doing what we're doing right now. And speaking of behind the scenes or things you can do to support one way you can support us is you can um, share on your social media. We don't, um, you know, force the issue, but since the pandemic has encouraged so many ministries to go online, that is how um, you can help people find us because searching us is like finding a needle in a haystack. But if you really feel like you've benefited from this ministry, feel free to share. And you don't have to share right now. And if you have some people you know on your Facebook or just in your life in general that don't have Facebook accounts, you can share on YouTube because we do um, put our services up on YouTube later in the day. So it should be available. But I am going to share right now. So not for any of you who are watching, but for those of you who will see, you know, you'll be able to see later on that, um, yeah, I have shared. 
because I'm not going to ask you to do something I wouldn't do for myself. But if sharing isn't your thing, you know what? We're okay with that. We're just happy that you are here. So I am sharing right now. And yeah, we hope that whether you share or not, you are getting something out of today's service. So we thank you for, you know, just your constant support. Like we said, there are a lot of people who work behind the scenes as volunteers, people who give money, people who just give encouraging words, and we love all of you. And I want to thank those of you who've also been sending comments so far. So that would be Deaconess Clayton, uh, Mom Rhonda, and of course, Cousin Sylvia. So good morning to all of you and to anybody else who is watching right now. You know, we are thankful for you. Um. But what we are going to do right now is we're going to go into our song for today. And, you know, because it's a communion Sunday, I felt led to go back and sing this song about the blood of Jesus once again. So that is what we're going to do. And I know some of you know the words, so feel free to sing along. And like I said, I will imagine I can hear you. And I look forward to um, the day that we can all come together and sing together once again. You know, when we get a building or when we have another um, in-person event. But for now, we're going to sing together in our households. All right. And I'll say what you all can't hear that I can hear right now is baby boy is upset. So I hear baby boy and first lady running back and forth. You know, that's what happens in a household with a baby. They run things, like I said. But now we're going to sing about the blood of Jesus. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to say it will never lose its power the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength 
from day to day it will never lose its power it soothes my doubts and calms my fears and it dries all my tears the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the flood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the flood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the flood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power Amen. Yeah, the blood will never lose its power. See a few more of you have joined us for service. So good morning, if I haven't said good morning already. Um, so we are going to move on to our announcements for today. So we don't really have too many. You know, just remember it's Communion Sunday. So get your symbols of the body and, blood and, body and blood of Christ together by communion service. Also, if you missed the announcement about what's going to happen with the future of your World Christian Ministries, well, the good news is that we have a video that talks about it. We kind of recorded a video, re-recorded the segment that we did last week, the presentation. So that will be available on Facebook and on YouTube right after service. Um, it will also be, well, a reduced version of it will be available on Instagram pretty soon. So stay tuned. But we are thankful that you all are here with us today um, on this, the first Sunday of September. And we will just continue moving forward with our service. Um, you know, just give me a chance to drink some tea, but we'll keep moving forward. And not that I feel like narrating what's happening in my household right now, but you can I can hear uh, Mom Rhonda and First Lady tending to baby boy upstairs. He's having quite the active morning, it seems. 
but you know, God is good, and we're thankful for Him. Yeah, so much personality. Hopefully, you all get to know Him once the services become you know in person again. But now we're going to move on to our um, message for today. So, if you can open your Bibles to Matthew chapter nine, that is Matthew chapter nine, beginning at verse thirty-two. So that's Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 32, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. So I'm at Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 32, and when you have it, feel free to type through amen. And while we're getting to that, I'll just remind you all that If you feel God leading you to make a donation, whether a tithe or an offering, you can click the link in our description or go to ywcministries.org slash donate, and that is how you can make your donation to us. We also would like for you to fill out a contact card, you know, if you feel so led, so that we can keep in touch with you and so that you'll know what we're we're doing behind the scenes. You know, any new events we have coming up, um, any programs, any promotions, anything that's going on in our ministry, we'll tell you about it. And we just love to be able to keep in touch with you. And lastly, if you'd like some more information, you can check out our website at ywcministries.org. So, Matthew chapter 9, verse 32. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And it reads thus. As they were going out, a mute demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So today, if we're um, taking notes, the title of today's message is When People Misrepresent Our Good. That is, when people misrepresent our good. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this privilege to come before you. We thank you for this time of fellowship and the love that exists within this community. Right now, we just pray that you would have your way, that you would get the glory out of all that we do here today but that you would use me as a vessel during this preaching moment to speak to these, your people. Speak a word through me. We pray that you would just move me out of the way and use me for your glory. That when people see, hear, or just experience me, they're really experiencing you. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. So when people misrepresent our good. So as I prayed about what I was going to preach on today, I felt God bring me to this passage. And it's a familiar passage that is often shared in ministry circles. You often hear ministers or believers in general say things like, you know, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And we say that as a means of encouraging ourselves to keep moving forward and what God has called us to do. But it's also a bit of a rallying cry that can be used to encourage others to join us in our cause. But however, God brought me to this passage for a different reason. You know, well, why? Well, because just a few verses before Jesus says this often quoted portion of this passage, um, Jesus has just finished healing a group of blind men and a demon-possessed man who was unable to speak. That's, you know, where I picked up today. And we know, as we pay attention to what's happening, the crowds were amazed by all Jesus has done. They're saying, wow, nothing like this has ever been seen here. But there is one group that is notably less enthusiastic, the Pharisees. And 
in review, you know, we understand that the Pharisees were a powerful group of religious leaders who felt that it was their role to maintain the purity of the Jewish faith. And thus, it makes sense that their name comes from the Hebrew word for separate. And we know that their existence was in response to the ways that the Hebrews um, historically were so quick to walk away from God and adopt some of the religious customs of their neighbors. This in spite of the fact that God explicitly told them not to do this several different times. So when we think about the existence of the Hebrew, I mean, not the Hebrews, of the Pharisees, we can think of this in the same way we think of other coping mechanisms that have outlived their usefulness, you know. It was the right thing to do for a certain amount of time, but now, you know, their rigidity was actually holding them back. Case in point, they did not even recognize the Messiah that they had been prophesying about for so long was there and walking among them. Instead, they pushed for him to be killed because he just wasn't what they thought he was going to be. So, as expected, uh, the Pharisees were against anything that Jesus was doing at this point. So much so that they quickly dismissed his healing miracles, you know, as him casting out demons by using a stronger demon. And that's a theory that in and of itself shows that the concept of alternative facts did not just originate during, you know, our recent political administration. Um, it's something that happened even back then. You know, people, especially those with a little bit of power, have always found a way to twist facts in a way that supports their preconceived notions or pre-existing conclusions. And that's what happened here. There was no way that anything that Jesus did was going to be seen as good by the Pharisees. But even though the Pharisees were saying this about Jesus, the passage doesn't make it clear if Jesus knew what they were saying, though you know we can think that he probably did because people talk, but we find that Jesus does not choose to respond to them in the moment. Instead, Jesus continues traveling, teaching, and healing many people before coming to the portion of this passage again. That is the part that is often quoted most often. And it's in this section that we can learn a lot from Jesus about how to handle people who willfully misrepresent our good as bad. So the goal of this sermon is to discuss three things that we can remember to help us handle such misrepresentation. And that kind of misrepresentation, unfortunately, is a very common part of living a Christian life. I mean, we all have experienced it or will experience it at some point in our lives. So this is a good passage to help us to see how we can handle it when it does happen. And since I gave a little bit of historical context, you know, I'm not going to give any additional, except just to say that, yeah, this is still relatively early in Jesus' ministry. So this brings me to my first point here. So what's the first thing we need to remember? We need to remember that sometimes when people mis misrepresent our good, the best response really is no response. You know, I think you think about like this, what is that saying that we have today in social media world, you know, don't feed the trolls? You know, there are some people who really just exist for the purpose of saying negativity. And the minute you, you know, throw some attention their way, they're getting what they want. Um, and this passage is a good example of that. Even that whole concept of not feeding the trolls was something that existed back during this point. So because we see... As we said, this was a time when Jesus had performed one of his many miracles of healing, only to have the Pharisees, who were kind of trollish at this point, claim that he was only able to do so because he was controlling demons. And that would be a frustrating scenario for most people, because I don't know about you, but one of my weaknesses is that I often feel the need to respond to willful misrepresentation of myself. And it's true. Somewhere, I'm sure, First Lady and Deaconess Clayton are shaking their heads in agreement because, but see, on some level, I know that some battles are not worth fighting, but I still have this need to set facts or people straight. It's something I'm working on. So when I read this passage, I can feel it stirring up something inside of me and not necessarily in a good way. It's safe to say that I would be livid 
if I were Jesus and I overheard people saying that I was healing people by casting out demons using a ruler of demons. When I knew that the source of my power was the one and only living God, those Pharisees would never have heard the end of it. And maybe some of you can relate, but that is not how Jesus chose to respond in this situation. He didn't try to tell anybody off or set anybody straight. Instead, he continued to focus on what was in front of him. And the passage makes it clear that Jesus continued going through cities and villages. Because what we have to remember is that even the process of setting people straight results in us expending a lot of energy. Like as I've gotten over, older, I have started to understand just how limited my energy really is. I mean, I know when you're young, you feel like you have unlimited time and unlimited energy. You can do anything. Oh, I see. I see Mom Rhonda acknowledging that she knows that I um, yeah, have that issue as well. Yes. Anybody who's around me knows that I always have to set things straight working on it. But um yeah, as I've gotten older, I understand that, yeah, I only have a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy to get anything done. And I've been learning to prioritize, you know, so now things like God and family take precedence. And that's especially now that I am a husband and a father. I know how important it is for my wife and son to receive the best from me and not just see me drained and tired all the time. So that means being careful how and when and where I expend my energy. So in other words, I just don't have the energy to spare to set people straight the way I once did. So this passage is helpful in keeping me moving in that direction because Jesus did not respond to the Pharisees. He knew their speech had no effect on his ability to be who he was called to be, so he kept going. And, you know, as I preface this point with the whole concept of feeding trolls, what we understand is that if Jesus was so bothered by what the Pharisees were doing at this point, he would have only served to spread, you know, the misinformation that the Pharisees were speaking about him. I mean, and, you know, we had an example of this even recently in the media. Well, not just in the media, but in the popular world. You know, some of you might follow what happened with the comedian, um, Ari Spears talking about Lizzo and her body. It was body shaming. You don't have to look it up if you haven't heard it. But in general, she didn't mention him by name in her response. She just, you know, kept living and was happy as she accepted that award at the MTV Video Music Awards last week. And so that's sometimes the best thing that we can do is just that. Focus on what God has in front of us instead of focusing on trying to set people straight because in the end you know the truth will come out and their faulty motivations will come out and i am going to say it's important to note that in this instance jesus didn't call out the pharisees but a few chapters later when they say the same thing about him and most notably it's in his presence he does call it out you know in fact, that is when Jesus says the part that is also often quoted when he talks about how a house divided against itself cannot stand. Like, why would it make sense for him to cast out demons using a demon? You know, and that's a part that we still quote to this day. You know, a house divided cannot stand. So I'm not going to say like you never should respond, but it's simply a reminder that sometimes it's not worth it. Sometimes a response is the right thing to give. Sometimes it is better for us to preserve our energy and keep moving forward. And Jesus was a great model for us to know when to do which. So now um, we are going to move on to the second point. So when people try to misrepresent our good, not only do we need to remember that sometimes the best response is no response, but we also need to remember that sometimes, not that sometimes, that often, that all the time, actually, our purpose is bigger than our naysayers. Again, our purpose is bigger than our naysayers. So the reason that Jesus was able to ignore the Pharisees this time is that he was focused on the matter at hand. He was busy traveling to the cities and villages, you know, healing and teaching and performing all the miracles that he was called to do. And the passage also points out that while he was doing all that 
And while he came into contact with so many people, he was moved with compassion because he knew like these were people who were like sheep in need of a shepherd. So he could, he was not only healing these people, not only teaching these people, but he came to really understand these people and what they were going through. And that just reinforced for him that he was in the right place doing exactly what he was called to do. How does this relate to us? Well, by continuing to move forward in his purpose, Jesus was able to put the Pharisees in perspective. You know, by this point, it shouldn't be surprising to us at all that the Pharisees were going to show up and complain about Jesus. As I said, that is what they did. That is what they did throughout his whole ministry. But Jesus didn't let that stop him. He just kept doing what he was called to do. Because see, the thing we have to understand here is that even when there are people speaking out against us, um, the thing that God has called for us to do still stands. The Pharisees' complaints didn't mean that Jesus wasn't needed as a teacher or a healer. In that same way, when the people who try to put us down today do so, they have no control over what God ultimately wants out of us. And I know many of us can relate to this. You know, most of us have stories about people who we came into contact with who were some of the most discouraging people that we've ever met. And if we're honest about it, many of us met those people in church. For us, they became our personal Pharisees, always coming up with some reason why we can't do the very thing that God has put it on our hearts to do. I know I personally met a lot of mine during my college years when I talked about feeling that I had a call to pastoral ministry. And maybe you experienced it with something else that was very close to your heart. Something that you know that you know that you know deep down within your soul that God called you to do. That God created you to complete. And then as you pursue it and tell people about your pursuit of it, you find that someone who you thought would support you and encourage you is just shutting you down instead. But that's the thing about Pharisees. They're everywhere and they're powerful. And there's one additional thing that God helped me to see in going over this is that, you know, we don't know a lot about Jesus's life before his ministry started. I mean, we, we have a few instances here and there, like, you know, when he went to the temple and things like that. But we don't really know a lot except that he went to the temple and that he was in the synagogues and that he learned a lot. And, you know, so what we can at least deduce from that is that Jesus probably had contact with Pharisees for most of his life. He probably knew them pretty well. I mean, you know, I can say as a church kid, you know, growing up in the church, you know who the people are who were in power. You know who those leaders are. And maybe, you know, as a youth, as a young adult, maybe he just wasn't on their radar at that time. You know, because we have to understand this. Jesus did not become an enemy of the religious establishment, which would have included the Pharisees, until he started his ministry at the age of 30, which means he probably had, you know, several more or less benign interactions with them. In fact, he might have even had a working relationship with them. So just imagine how painful that could be if the very leaders who, you know, you spent time with, you know, suddenly turn on you once they recognize what is going on in your life. You know, the leaders that you may have looked up to, the leaders who may have supported you, suddenly turn because they just don't understand what it is God is doing through you. And, and I thought about that because that's something that a lot of us can relate to. That for all of us, you know, we think of the Pharisees as being these like consistent thorns in Jesus' side. But we have to acknowledge that, you know, People don't always start out like that. Sometimes it's the people who are closest to us that become the thorn in our side as we pursue the things God called us to do. So I just wanted to put that out here because we are so quick to think, oh, yeah, that person's a Pharisee. But the thing that, you know, can get us with Pharisees is that, like I said, they can be that person that was close to you up until you got to a point where the thing you were doing upset their sensibilities. And then suddenly becomes like, oh, no, like, we can't stand for this at all. So, in other words, and we know this because if you look over the story of Jesus, you find that once Jesus starts saying he's the son of God, remember, in one of the gospel accounts, people in Jesus' own hometown tried to run him off a cliff because they thought he lost his mind. So, just putting that out here for you. 
But in any event, though, what Jesus shows us here is that we can't let those naysayers slow us down. People needed to hear Jesus teach. People needed to experience Jesus so that he could heal them. And in that same way, there are people who need what God has placed inside of us. So we can't ignore or neglect those people who need us because of the people who put us down. Which brings me to my final point. So, in addition to needing to remember that sometimes the best response is no response and that our purpose is bigger than our naysayers, we also need to remember that we should not be ashamed to ask for help. Again, we should not be ashamed to ask for help. So one thing that I really like about this passage is how it ends, at least the section that we've talked about for today. Jesus doesn't just acknowledge that the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few, which is the part that we tend to quote, but he also asks God to send more laborers into his harvest, which we're going to get to. This is important for several reasons, and I'm going to go into a few of them one by one. So first, we got to think of this notion of harvest, right? You know, Jesus was speaking to a mostly agrarian, meaning farm-based society, so they understood the notion of harvest very well. They understood that harvest time represents a small window of time when crops are optimal for picking. Thus, they knew that Jesus was observing how this would be the perfect time for him to spread his good news. And indeed it was as he went and taught and healed that there were plenty of people who were coming to understand his ministry and who he was. So he was really doing what God called him to do. Jesus was somebody who focused a lot on timing. You read his story, there were a lot of times where he'd say, you know, don't tell anybody what I did. It's not time for people to know. It's not time yet. Jesus cared about timing. So when he talks about the harvest, it's just a reminder that Jesus knew this was the time for him to be who he was called to be. Secondly, we have to see how Jesus models this for us, the importance of knowing our limits. You know, we know that Jesus was God in the flesh and that he still had all power in his hands while he walked among us in the flesh. So he didn't have any limits. But in asking God to send more laborers, Jesus is modeling what we should do when we figure out the things that God has asked us to do are larger and more complex than we may have anticipated. You know, see, unlike Jesus, we don't always know what we're getting ourselves into. We just trust in God and see where he leads us. And sometimes he'll lead us to places we can manage with our own skill sets and resources. But often God brings us places that are far outside of our comfort zones. And these places require us to collaborate with and delegate to others. I know that's what I'm finding right now as a pastor, that in order for us to continue moving forward as a ministry, I have to build up our team so that we can be more effective, so that we can reach more people, so that we can do what it is that God has called us to do. And contrary to what we may believe, no man is an island. I know many of us try to function as if we're islands, but God created us to be social creatures. God created us to have fellowship with him and fellowship with one another. As such, it's only natural that for many of us, the only way we can be who God called us to be is to share and work with others who are also headed in that same direction. And that is why our churches are so important. See, our churches are a natural outgrowth of believers who unite under a common purpose. And no, I'm not just talking about the Great Commission. That is important to all of us who are believers. We know, you know, when it says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you know, Matthew 28, we know that. And if you are a church that is not organized around that, there's a problem. But there's also a bit more that any particular body of believers is called to do. That's why God calls us into existence. You know, we at this church in the middle of a name change, but currently still known as your will, we know we're generally people who are passionate about social issues that are happening in our society. We care about the polarization and tribalism, and tribalism in our political system. We care about the rampant inequalities that exist in our society. We care about exposing and rooting out all structures of oppression. And in fact, a lot of you who've been watching us recently have found us as a ministry 
for these reasons. You found us because you're looking for a church that's not afraid to talk about these kinds of complex issues, that's not afraid to have the difficult conversations about what is plaguing us and holding us back as a society. And we, as a ministry, are able to work together to tackle issues related to these concepts because they are important to us. But we could never be effective as we are currently. We could never be as effective as we are currently without working together. So we shouldn't be ashamed to ask God for help because he will connect us with those people who are his laborers who are looking to tackle the same kinds of issues that we are tackling. And I know this is hard because, like I've said, we live in a society, you know, those of us, the majority of us are Americans here. And our society definitely prioritizes what? Individualism, exceptionalism. So sometimes we feel like we are not as good as maybe we should be if we need to work with other people, if we can't do it alone, because our society tends to like, it tends to really prop up those who do it alone. You know, there are all these lists about self-made billionaires. I remember how not that long ago, Kylie Jenner was on that list. People were like, wait, how is she a self-made billionaire when she just managed to parlay her um, fame from reality TV, from her family show into a business? You know, so, she didn't just start from nothing. She was already wealthy. But what I'm getting at is that we as a society do um, place a lot of stock into people who, you know, did it on their own, figured it out from nothing. We love a rags to riches story. But even in those rags to riches stories, those people had help along the way. They had a mentor. They had a chance meeting that changed their life. And so in that same way, we should not be ashamed when we have to reach out and ask for more support to do what it is that we are called to do. So thirdly, though, we need to acknowledge that the harvest itself belongs to God. That means that even if the portion of the harvest we are meant to gather is connected to something that is near and dear to our hearts, it still belongs to God and not us. And I know this can be difficult for some of us because we can get so territorial in the things we do, even as an expression of our faith. And if you don't believe me, just spend time in the church, maybe in the music department, and you'll see how territorial some singers and musicians can become. Just let somebody sing someone else's song. Never mind the fact that said person may not have sung that particular song in 25 years. You know, it's still theirs. And the next thing you know, there's chaos in the choir loft because a new director gives a new soloist a song that they, you know, should have known not to have given. Never mind the fact that said offended person has been in the choir for 18 years. I know this might sound like an exaggeration, but you get the picture. But can we really take ownership over something that belongs to God? Is our goal to be known or is our goal for God to be known? That's what we really need to be asking ourselves. And lastly, we need to remember that God is bigger than the negative rumors that are being spread about us. I know this is a bit of what we said in the last point, but... You know, it can be pretty discouraging, but, and as my mother, Deaconess Clayton, is so fond of saying, it's hard to defend yourself against a lie. And we've established by now that the Pharisees lied on Jesus because he was a threat to their way of life. But by remembering this in our work, that um, Jesus is bigger, you know, than those negative rumors, you know, we can remember that as we're asking God to send laborers into his harvest, that those people that God sends will be able to see through those efforts to disparage us. You know, if it's God's harvest, God knows who he's going to send, and God has the ability to send those people in spite of what people have been saying about us. So I know I have said, you know, no matter what people say, they can't really get in the way of what God has called us to be, but they can certainly create some obstacles. But even in those obstacles that they create, God can still send the people that we need to do what it is that he's called us to do as long as we really are focused and doing exactly what it is that God has called us to do. Meaning as long as we are operating based on what he is telling us, not based on our own desires. So as we come to the end of this message, I want to leave us with this one additional thought. 
And that is we need to examine ourselves to make sure the things we believe to be false about ourselves are actually false. What do I mean by this? Well, a lot of this message up to this point presupposes a level of self-awareness that many of us just don't possess. You know, sometimes people are liars who are trying to hurt us, you know, trying to create obstacles, trying to manipulate the situation to make themselves look good and us look bad, trying to gaslight us. You know, sometimes that's true. But sometimes there are things about how we come across to others that we just are not aware of. And I'm going to give an example of this from my own life. So when I was in high school, I caught wind of um, the fact that one of my classmates was telling people about how unapproachable I was. And it bothered me. I mean, even then, you know, this was a white woman and I was aware of the politics of a white woman saying that a black man was unapproachable. You know, I knew, though, that she wasn't the kind of person to exaggerate, but I couldn't figure out what I had done to make her feel that I was so unapproachable, you know, outside of maybe just being big and black. So naturally, though, the person who told me it said, you know, they didn't understand it either because they've always seen me to be a nice person and they actually defended me in the conversation. But it still bothered me. So I thought about it and, you know, because that's how my mind works. I was going over every interaction I had with this person to try to figure it out. And eventually, you know, I came to the conclusion that she meant I don't smile when I see her. That was it. I'm not the most smiley of people. And for the record, you all know I do smile a lot in conversation or in talking but, you know, my resting face may not be the most pleasant of faces. So although I didn't appreciate this classmate telling people I was unapproachable, especially with the racialized nature of it all that she may or may not have been aware of, um, I had to acknowledge that my face does make me read unapproachable to some people. And for the record, that's something that I'm still working with, working through to this day. I mean, several times per year. I'll get some person calling me mean because my resting face is not a smile. And I've even had people tell me, people close to me tell me that I need to smile more in order to show the love of Christ in my life, you know, as if a smile is the most, you know, strongest indicator of whether or not somebody really has Jesus in their life. And that was hurtful because if I'm honest, I do work hard to show the love of Christ in my life. But I also believe that a part of showing the love of Christ in my life is living a life of authenticity instead of performance. And I've talked about this before, but I have seen the damage that that causes for some people in their faith when their faith becomes something that they do, a way they perform, a way that they show others how good they are, but it never becomes something that changes their heart. It never becomes something that changes their actions, that changes the way they actually speak to people. You know, you could be nasty with a smile. What do they call it? Nice nasty. And I know some of you have been watching the movie um, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. We're going to watch it sometime this weekend. But one thing about that movie that's so funny is Regina Hall playing that first lady. You know, she seemed like that first lady just from the commercials, the epitome of nice nasty. You know, cut you with a smile. But yet people will get on me for not smiling. I'm sure y'all probably won't cut you with my words unless you're mean. But, you know, all I'm saying is that I've had to become aware that because I'm not as smiley, that people might say things about me being unapproachable and that there may be a kernel of truth to it once I find out what they're actually saying. So... But the reason I share this is that it's important for us to examine ourselves in the face of what we may believe to be falsehoods, because sometimes the issue isn't a falsehood. Sometimes it's a lack of awareness on our part. And I see First Lady chiming in when it's nice, nasty, or nicety. Exactly, nicety. I'll say some church people have nicety on lock. Um, but yeah, but sometimes it's just a lack of awareness on our part. And Jesus was clearly not using a demon to cast out a demon. We know that. But sometimes the things that we perceive as misrepresentations are just subtle enough that they can contain a kernel of truth. In other words, sometimes people are not misrepresenting us. We are misrepresenting us. But 
if and when you are sure that you're being misrepresented, you know your heart, you know your mind, you know yourself, you know how you're coming across. If you know that people are lying on you, if we, when we know people are lying on us, we need to remember that we serve a God who is greater than those lies. We serve a God that is greater than that misrepresentation. We serve a God who is greater than the way people can try to manipulate us for their own ends. So in the end, when people misrepresent our good for bad, we need to keep doing what we're doing because it means ultimately we are moving in the right direction. And when the time is right, God will give us a chance to set things straight. God bless you. God bless all of you. Now let me drink some tea and then we are going to open the doors of the church. So today's message was all about you know, how to handle it when people misrepresent us. And what I've said is that it's very important for us to know who we are. And a lot of us knowing who we are is starting with having that personal relationship with God who can reveal to us who we are, who can reveal to us what his purpose was for creating us when he did. And for some of us, we might be wondering, how do we even start this relationship with God? I know it's a very abstract concept, but I'm going to put it in the simplest terms I can. To start this relationship with God, we have to believe in Jesus and what Jesus did for us. Jesus being his son, who was also, him, who was also God in the flesh, who came down and died on the cross for our sins. Because, see, the sins that we committed, starting with our earliest ancestors, Adam and Eve, would have made it impossible for us to have the kind of relationship with God that God wanted us to have from the beginning. So to set things straight, he sent his son Jesus to die in our place so that we can have that closeness that he always wanted us to have. So if you would like to begin this process of getting to know God and having God reveal to you who he made you to be, you just have to repeat this prayer after me to start the process. You can say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. If you prayed that prayer with me, congratulations, you are now saved. We would love to hear from you. You can fill out a contact card at this link below. It is also listed in the description that should be above this message or below it, depending on if you're watching us on um, YouTube. But and you can click that link. Um, we'd love to hear from you through a contact card. That way you can hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. And we'll pray with you, help you figure out your next steps. Whether those next steps are, you know, to become a member of Your World Christian Ministries, to become an affiliate member because we know that you might be a part of another, or you might want to become a part of another ministry that's a little closer to you. Or you might just want us to help you find a church that where you can actually fellowship with people in person. But whatever that is, we want to be there for you in that process as you figure out your next steps in your journey as a believer. Or maybe you are somebody who already believes in Jesus, but you feel like God is leading you to become a part of your will Christian ministries. Maybe you like our emphasis on social justice and the fact that we're not afraid to talk about complex issues in our society. Whatever that is, if you feel God putting it on your heart to be a part of this ministry, we would love to have you. You could also fill out a contact card or you can leave us a comment. I should say for those who just accepted Christ, you can also leave us a comment in today's message. We'll get back to you. But you can leave us a comment, you know, and we will reach out to you. We'll pray with you, figure out your next steps, whether you um, would like to partner with us. We just want to help you do what it is that God has called for you to do in this time period. So you'll hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon, and we'll pray with you and figure out next steps. Or maybe you are somebody who is in need of prayer. We have already had some prayer requests coming through, and I thank you for that because I definitely neglected to mention that. But this is a time period where if you feel so led, you can share your prayer requests right now. Some of you already shared them, and we will be praying for them. Those of them that were shared live, we will be praying for them um, during this broadcast. If you watch later, 
Um, we will also pray for your prayer request, but obviously you won't see it. It happened right now. If you don't want your prayer request prayed for live, you can still send it to us in a contact card or in a direct message, and we'll still pray for you on the side because we do believe in the power of prayer. Whether you need us to stand in agreement with you or you need us to um, intercede on your behalf. Or maybe you're somebody who just wants more information about what we do. You can fill out the contact card and you'll be added to our mailing list where you'll hear more about the things we have going on as um, especially the transition that's going to happen with our name going from Your Will Christian Ministries to Pivot Point Gathering, you know, or any other events that we have coming up. You will hear about that. So we just thank you again for spending this time with us. And now we are going to move into our communion service. As we see, thank you, First Lady. Holy Communion is happening in a few moments. So you want to get your symbols of the body and blood of Christ together. And I'm going to get mine right now in just a minute. So if you can get your symbols of the body and blood of Christ together right now, just hold them up like I am. And then we're going to pray over them right now. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We just pray right now, you know, that you would bless these symbols that we are going to use to celebrate the awesome price that you paid by sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. We pray that you will bless these elements that represent the body and the blood of Christ and that you would just be glorified in this communion service. These things we ask your son, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so now I'm going to go to a section of scripture that I read every time we have communion service. And that is Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 26, which talks about the Lord's Supper which is what our communion services are based on. So it reads thus. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. The body and blood of Christ, let us all eat and drink thereof. Amen. So now um, we are going to I'm going to go back and review our prayer requests so that we can prepare to close out. But I just want to thank you all for joining us for service today. You know, it really means a lot that you all are still here. You all have been so supportive of this ministry. And we just pray that God will continue to use us um, to be there for you, to minister to you in the same way that you minister to us just by your presence and your kind words. So thank you all. All right, so as you all know, when I close out, I am going to have to glance every now and then to make sure I don't miss any comments that are coming up because, you know, sometimes you all put in prayer requests a little late, so I don't want to miss any. But rest assured, if I do miss any of your prayer requests, um, I will be able to come back to them later. So we will still pray over it even if it doesn't get prayed over during service. So with that, though, thank you again. We love you all, and, you know, if nobody told you that they love you this week, I love you, God loves you. Now, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this privilege to come before you once again. We thank you for the word that was preached, and we pray that you would just help us to find the strength to continue to keep going, even when people may be a bit negative. We just thank you for the model that you have provided for us in your son, Jesus. 
who walked among us, who lived like we would have to live to show us how we can exist in this world and give you the glory and the honor that you deserve. And we just pray that we would truly walk in his footsteps, walk like he did, talk like he did, be like he is, and continue to represent him in this world and continue to represent you in this world. But right now, um, we pray um, for all the prayer requests that have been shared thus far. We thank you for the willingness of those to share. And we pray that you would just get the glory out of this time period. So right now, we pray for Sister Victoria, that you keep her in prayer as she looks for a new job. We thank you that you have been with her as she's been able to find jobs when she needs them. She has the skills. And we just pray that you will open the right door, help her to find a place that is the right fit with the right kind of supervisor and the right kind of benefits, a job that she'll be able to settle into for some time. And we also pray for uh, Sylvia and her health. You know her needs. We thank you that you've given her this great testimony that she's been living so long with this chronic illness. But we just pray that you would have your way in her life and that you would just draw her closer to you and show yourself in her life and in whatever it is she is going through right now. Um, we also would like to pray for family and friends of Deaconess Clayton. You know the needs, but we just thank you that um, whatever needs exist within that circle, that you would work on their behalf, show yourself in our lives, and continue to just... Give us the testimonies that we need that people will come to know more about you as they interact with us. People will draw closer to you as they experience you and hear about your goodness and your grace and your mercy just from our lives. We pray that you would show yourself that we would be more like you and that we would be able to counteract some of what's happening in our society with all these things that are being done in your name by people who truly don't know you. But we just pray you would have your way, show yourself, raise up true believers who will represent you, you know, who are truly not afraid to worship you in spirit and in truth. But now, as we end this service and leave this place, we pray that you would just continue to um, keep us protected. Let your angels encamp round about us to keep us in awe of our ways and that you would just keep us protected as we leave this service until we're able to come back together once again. We love you, and we pray that your love would shine through us and be within us, you know, that we will have the strength to make it for another week, and just that we'll be able to encourage one another as we definitely need that encouragement in these trying times. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all, and God willing, we will see you next week.